Welcome to this special presentation, an interfaith mental health conversation sponsored by the Blue Dove Foundation. The event, part of hashtag quieting the silence initiative, addresses how faith communities can best serve individuals and families confronting mental health and substance abuse challenges, as well as how we can best promote mental well-being. The event took place on October 17, 2019 at Temple Sinai in Atlanta. The panel was moderated by Melissa Waller, a clinical mental health counselor. As you've read in the bios, I am a clinical mental health counselor and a candidate for my doctoral degree at Mercer University in counseling education and supervision. So I teach counselors. Um, and the conversation came up, Gabby and I had long talks about mental health and faith in our community. So we just want to open the dialogue to the community and really address the needs and the concerns and your thoughts and feelings in regards to mental health around faith. Um, prior to getting started, I want to let the audience know that if you are triggered, meaning there are some, there's some type of emotional response or arousal that you may have, we do have counselors on staff right here tonight, this evening, if you need to speak with someone. So please let us know. Um, you can step out and there are counselors waiting to serve you. Um, so what we'll do is we'll go ahead and get started. So I'm going to ask of each of the panelists to introduce yourselves. Um, take about three to five minutes, Pastor. Um, my father is a Baptist pastor, so I came back to a pastor. <laughs> um, so three to five minutes to introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do, and as it relates to faith and mental health, um, and your thoughts and opinions on that in your community. I guess if you keep passing me my... <laughs> Um, thank you, um, and, and uh, everybody can get long-winded, so I'll keep, try to keep an eye on the time. My name is uh, Nabil Sufther. I'm a, a physician by training, but um, the reason I'm involved with mental health more is um, because um, there's a big need in the Muslim community, in the American Muslim community, to address issues around emotional and mental health. Um, many folks have even gone as far as to say that there's a crisis in the community. Um, in particular with youth, but also with other populations, other demographics as well. I first got much more involved when I was doing my master's, and we were studying and um, researching barriers to access within the community. And one of the topics that came up over and over again was the shame, the stigma, the access issues, and the knowledge gaps around how to deal with mental health. And it was across all demographics. The Muslim American community is very diverse, um, ethnically, racially, um, socioeconomic class, education. But across all of that different spectrum, everybody said this is an issue that we're struggling with. And so the um, organizations that I'm involved in um, perform education to help close that knowledge gap and just talk about things because that's how folks can start to accept that there's nothing to be ashamed about, there's no stigma or there shouldn't be any stigma in seeking help if they need to. Uh, about 30% of American Muslims report um, having, uh, up to 30% of report having anxiety, an anxiety disorder, and up to 25% at some point have a, a reported having a mood disorder. So that's some of the reasons that I'm here. Thank you. Hi, my name is uh, Daiki, and I'm a um, Buddhist priest. Particularly, I'm in the Zen school of Buddhism and in a Japanese uh, Buddhist school that's called Soto Zen. And in speaking with my teacher about preparing for this speech, he said, I said, I only have three to five minutes, Daishin. And he said, oh, don't worry. Nobody pays any attention to that. So uh, <laughs> I'll try to pay attention to it, nevertheless. And, um, so I started uh, sitting meditation, or I should say that Buddhism in this country is so intertwined with mental health. Uh, most of the people that come to practice Buddhism 
uh, most of what I call Western converts to Buddhism come almost 99% of the time out of a sense of uh, addressing mental health, mm -hmm. coming from a place of anxiety or depression, uh, looking to have a more centered and calm life. So, I mean, we kind of address mental health in our faith practice right from the beginning. So sometimes it's even hard to kind of get away from that into studying uh, some of the other doctrines of Buddhism. But at any rate, um, so from the very beginning, um, the Buddha taught that human suffering is caused by our attachment to the concept of self, of having a self. And um, that through um, meditation and, and right living, we can um, come to understand how tenuous um, our concept of self is. So the Buddha taught that um, living itself is suffering. And that sounds kind of negative, but his um, meaning behind that was living as a separate self, separate from the universe, separate from each other, um, and seeking your own personal desires all the time. That's suffering. So when you have the opportunity, um, maybe when you're really suffering and you have the opportunity to say there has to be something more than this, and then the opportunity to um, seek a path of wisdom, to transcend yourself, that that's the beginning of the Buddha's path. And uh, so through, in our faith tradition, through meditation and um, a set of prescriptions for correct living, we work on lessening the grip on this concept of self. Because we believe strongly that there is no separate self. We all belong, we're all the universe. We're all creation. We all have the divine in us and are surrounded by it at all times. So um, my teacher likes to say, he uh, does a meditation that, uh, so let's, he would say, so sit in meditation and keep in mind that you have everything inside of you that's outside of you and everything you need is inside of you except for one thing and that one thing is yourself. So I guess I'd just leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you for sharing. Pastor James. <laughs> I'm James Lampkin. I'm pastor of Northside Drive Baptist Church here in Atlanta and have been pastor uh, there for 22 years. Um, I'm uh, grateful to be invited to the gathering by uh, the Blue uh, Dove Foundation. Thank you, Gabby. Thank you, uh, Sari and uh, also to the hospitality of Temple Sinai. You've always been a welcoming place, uh, the many times I've been here, and to uh, Rabbi Ron and Rabbi Brad, uh, who are friends and we've traveled the world together as world pilgrims. Uh, my life is larger because of uh, both of them. I would be afraid if I were you seeing a Baptist preacher with a microphone and a bunch of notes. <laughs> uh, I, I will uh, compress. Uh, it's been a while since I studied Hebrew, so I had to look up Sukkot and uh, Sukkah, but I did, and I see that Sukkah means a temporary shelter, it means portable covering, and I think Sukkoth, uh, Sukkah in this setting means halfway house. It means uh, that we are no longer where we were but we're always becoming who we are meant to be. We're no longer in bondage, addiction, uh, and we're on our way to the promised land, which is recovery. We also need to stop by the Sukkah on occasion, at least annually, because we relapse as human beings and remember that God is with us in the wilderness times as well. As I read the scriptures, uh, uh, the, the New Testament arises around the life of Jesus of Nazareth. And he was called many uh, names, uh, the Christ, uh, the teacher, a rabbi. Uh, and one of the things he was called was a healer. 
several of the stories in the New Testament Gospels are about him healing people. And the way that I would say his job as a healer was, was taking on the forces that have taken captive the imago dei. Of taking on the forces that have taken captive the image of God uh, in the people he encountered. And with Jesus, it seems to me the healings uh, were not just symptom relief. Uh, it was bigger than that. It was something about community reconnection, of putting a person back with family that had been alienated or back into uh, community. An example of that uh, is the Gadarene demoniac, this guy that was supposedly possessed with demons, lived north of the Sea of Galilee. Jesus comes to him in a graveyard, and he's torn off all his clothes, and he's torn off all the chains because they couldn't control him. And uh, Jesus asks him, what's his name? And he says, Legion, for many. And uh, so Jesus heals him. Next day, Jesus comes by, and there he is sitting there, clothed and in his right mind, mental health, right? And uh, the guy wants to go follow Jesus. And Jesus says, no, I've got enough followers. You don't, don't come with me, but go home. Uh, go back to the village, and, uh, and you've got a story to tell. That somehow the healings of Jesus was all, were always about the restoration of uh, community. Uh, I think Christianity may have made a bad turn when it turned toward Greek philosophy in that it segregated out people as in body and mind and soul and spirit and exactly where those territorial lines are drawn, I don't know. Uh, I think I'm more Hebrew. I think we, we should have stayed with those roots that we, we are a soul, we don't have a soul, we're a body soul, and, and all, of, all of who we are is connected with all of the rest of who we are, and as uh, you were saying, with all, of, with all the universe. Here's the last three things uh, uh, that I believe. It's the intersection for me of, of my Christian faith and mental health. I'm going to call it a, a sukha spirituality. Number one, emotional well-being takes a village. I think when we get isolated, we get in trouble. There's a country western song out there, Me and Jesus, We Got a Good Thing Going. I don't like that. I think that's a category in the DSM-5 or something. And then you can get marooned and cut off with that kind of thinking. Emo emotional health is a family issue in congregation or, or family life. Second thing, recovery groups work. It works if you work it and you are worth it. Some of us know those lines well. Some of us go weekly to those meetings. For me, it's like a tuning fork that reminds me of uh, uh, accountability and uh, who I am. Uh, I encourage you to look at Al-Anon and, and Alateen and AA and all of the uh, recovery groups that are like a parallel universe. Um, they're free, but they help, and uh, I'm for the 12 steps. Last thing, spiritual practices are a probiotic. They are like vitamins for the immune system's soul. Whatever rituals you do, you do them, right? Daily or weekly. And here we are at one that's annual at the, the sukkah. Uh, we come full circle on this sukkah spirituality because just coming back to a place that's temporary reminds us of our own temporariness, but our need for uh, ritual and connecting with each other. Uh, that's what I think. Emotional well-being takes a village, recovery groups work, and spiritual practices are vitamins for the soul. Thank you. I want to um, echo Rabbi Brad's welcome to all of you into our home at Temple Sinai, um, and thank you for um, gracing us with your, um, with your wisdom tonight, and thank you all for being here. Um, uh, as a cantor, my, my main... Uh, uh, type of communication is music. Um, I do the musical intonations of, of all of our prayers. I live, I live in a prayer place. And 
uh, as a leader, and I, I don't know about my, my colleagues here, I know that sometimes that can be very isolating. And I know many of my own colleagues, including myself, um, suffer from depression. And, um, and I know that if it's happening to me, I know it's also happening to my congregants. And one thing that uh, I've noticed over the last couple of decades is uh, the change in Jewish practice from one where we are very much a, a people who studies, we like to study texts, and we like to intone prayers, um, but also we need to, um, to come to a, a, a mind and body practice that was not so much uh, a part of, of Jewish observance. And what has happened over the last um, decade or so is that if on a, on a Saturday morning, which would be our Sabbath, um, you would find uh, more Jewish people at the yoga studio than you would in the sanctuaries. And, and that sent a very clear message uh, to us as practitioners and as leaders of prayer that um, just studying something that's on the page, just singing a prayer isn't enough. Even those, those, those things are part of the connective tissue of the Jewish people who rely so heavily on community. We are a people that requires a community to pray, right? We need, we need a minimum of 10 people to intone the, the, the basic prayers of Judaism. So Judaism is about community. Um, but it's more than just praying what's on the page. We're really good at what's reading, what, reading what's on the page. But, um, but it's new to us to study mindfulness, to have a bodily practice, a meditative practice. So many of us have been influenced now by our Buddhist brothers and sisters because uh, you, you get it. And, and we're new to this. Um, and so I believe that Judaism is evolving um, and learning what it means to address mental health. Um, we're so quick to run to the aid of someone who, God forbid, has cancer, a heart condition, a broken bone. We offer prayers for healing. We lift their names up in a service. And we offer uh, our, our communal embrace to these people who are broken in some way. And yet, those who suffer from mental illness suffer in silence. They feel isolated. They feel disconnected from the community. And how sad it is that um, we haven't, over time, lifted those people up in the same way and made them feel safe and made them feel uh, cared for. Um, so I think that's something that Judaism is evolving to do. And there's a wonderful, um, we have plenty of examples of of strugglers in the Bible. I mean, every, every book of the Bible has a, a struggler in it, um, from Noah to Jacob to Hannah to David. Um, we, we hear their stories, and our hearts break for them, and we, we, we feel their pain. Um, but there's a, a piece from, from the Talmud that I, I thought would be really nice to share for tonight that kind of um, informs what... I feel I need to do as, as someone who, who works in the Jewish community. Uh, the Gemara, which is a commentary um, on, on Talmud, on, on Torah, um, talks about uh, a rabbi, um, uh, Rabbi Yochanan, and he had a student named Rabbi Chia. And Rabbi Yochanan entered and visited him and said, is your suffering dear to you? He was sick. Do you desire to be ill and afflicted? And Rabbi Chia said to him, I welcome neither this suffering nor its reward, as one who welcomes this suffering with love is rewarded. And Rabbi Yochanan said, give me your hand. And he, he healed him. And then Rabbi Yochanan himself fell ill, and Rabbi Hanina entered to visit him and said to him the same words, is your suffering dear to you, and Rabbi Yochanan said, I welcome neither this suffering nor its reward. Rabbi Hanina said to him, well, give me your hand. And he gave him his hand, and Rabbi Hanina stood up and restored him to health. And the Gemara asked the question, why did Rabbi Yochanan wait for Rabbi Hanina to restore him to health? He was the healer, 
Why couldn't he heal himself? And the Gemara says, a prisoner cannot free himself from prison and depends on others to release, release him from his shackles. And so I feel that the, that the role of, of the religious institution, the faith institution, is to help those people who can't release themselves from their pain and to be that safe place, that open heart, the ear, the hand, um, and the soul that reaches out and connects with one who is feeling pain, whether it's the pain of addiction, whether it is um, the pain of, of depression, and the suffering that goes so uh, silently into the night. Um, we, we have a, a sacred responsibility um, to help people mend their spirits. Um, being sick is not being broken. Being sick is being sick. And just as we would pray for someone who has pneumonia and wants, want them to be whole, um, so is it also with someone who suffers from addiction or depression um, that we need to be agents that help them find wholeness. And there are so many modalities to do that, whether it's prayer, whether it's meditation, whether it's study, whether it's counseling. Um, we have um, a wonderful opportunity as faith leaders to be part of the recipe for healing. And, um, and I find it to be a, a privilege to, to sit in that seat and to, to be uh, invited into people's lives who uh, are in need of, of a non-judgmental partner uh, in healing. Um, a couple of quick questions. Um, Nabil, for you, what's the hardest part about talking about mental health issues? So um, the question is, what's the hardest part about talking about mental health issues? Um, I personally am comfortable talking about mental health issues. Um, but the communities which I travel in, it's all over the place. There's some congregations which, you know, they have regular programs. They've had this conversation. They have folks who are trained in the congregation to know they can be the res a first responder to someone who, whether they're in crisis or they just need to talk. And there are other communities where I may be a part of or travel to um, where that conversation has never happened. And there is still so many, there are still so many barriers to having that conversation. Sometimes it's cultural Sometimes people don't have the vocabulary to speak it. Um, sometimes there really is shame which people hold internally. And other times they're afraid, it's the stigma, they're afraid of what others will think or say about them. And so for me, um, just raising the awareness over and over again, talking about it, because that shame and stigma is so hard to overcome um, that unless people feel safe, like you were saying earlier, that it's okay to talk about that. It's okay to go to someone for help. It's okay to acknowledge that you may need help yourself. Um, when I walk into a place and I see, because um, every community has people who are struggling. Every community has people that are struggling at any given moment. And sometimes it's the leaders and sometimes it's folks who are, have informal leadership. And um, when I see that they've had programming and they've had the conversation, that's just the very first step. But when they haven't even had that first step, that really breaks my heart. It makes it difficult, because I know there are people in that community that are struggling who haven't been able to come forward yet. So the most difficult thing for me is to know that there are communities where this conversation doesn't happen. Once the conversation happens, then people get over that initial hesitation and the conversation only gets easier over time. Absolutely, it, it takes away the stigma of feeling as if they're the only ones struggling. You know, we are all human and so it supports them with the resources and having someone else that can identify with the struggle or the challenge. Thank you for sharing that. I'm Jane. 
a question for you is, um, what do you feel are the most pressing issues amongst our youth with mental health? Their parents. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm just kind of kidding on, on that. Or their, or their grandparents. I'm, I'm a grandparent. Uh, um, I, I think anxiety is uh, the norm of our society today. And I think uh, youth can be uh, symptoms or carry the symptoms of the anxiety that is in the family, in the human family. Um, media is a part of that story, I think, uh, and all of the uh, attachments we have to our uh, electronics. But I, I would say that the, um, the leadership in families would be the biggest challenge and I think the greatest gift. And so for me as a congregation leader, I'm always trying to figure out how, how do I be the best leader that I can be and then how do I help leaders in the congregation or parents in the congregation. And I think I think if the parents can, can work on their own selves and their lives, it's the best gift that they can give to their children. Uh, the children aren't something to fix. Uh, it is, it is a, a spiritual uh, health to, to be. I'm not sure that answers the question, but that's what I think about when I, I think about uh, the challenges of youth that's, that's bigger than the youth the question because there's actually research that backs that up that the symptomology presented within children the first question asked is what's going on at home um, it mirrors what's going on in the lives of the parent or guardian at times so thank you that's exactly what I was looking for oh, good. Good. Daiki um, what are the most acute mental health concerns you have for our community I think honestly the most uh, acute mental health uh, concern I have is um, just getting people to slow down and stop. And it seems that as, as I'm getting older that our society is becoming more and more distracted just almost by the day or the month of the year. And I think how will you know future generations or even in five years, how will anyone get anyone to stop and slow down and unplug and just even get in tune with nature, much less, you know, step into a spiritual contemplative path. So that's um, just for me what I really am most acutely aware of. Thank you, and I agree with you. <laughs> um, Beth, are there any obstacles that you can think of um, that we need to overcome by addressing mental health issues? Um, there are obstacles certainly outside the, the, uh, the institutions that we serve, um, access to uh, medication, um, access to uh, affordable counseling. Um, those are certainly obstacles that so many of our members um, face and they, they come in, in, the, in spiritual crisis um, and, and we are certainly here to be that cushion, but some of the more clinical things that our, that our, our members and our, and our communities need, um, I think we become advocates for them uh, uh, in, in the community, in, in, in policy making, uh, even though we're, we're, not, uh, we're not a government institution here, but we certainly wanna advocate for what our members need. Um, I also think, um, Daiki, that uh, I, I echo you that that our attachment to our electronics, while we think they build community, um, actually separate us and 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 um, and isolate us. Um, we, uh, anyone who's been on Facebook, uh, raise your hand if you can remember the last bad news that someone posted on Facebook. We're all putting forward this this face of everything's okay, um, I'm good, uh, here are my successes, here's how great my kids are, here's how great my family is, here's how great my job is. Um, we feel this pressure to put a front on 
that uh, may not be so realistic and, and that creates a pressure for other people who are then looking at their lives and saying, wow, uh, I don't think my life is, is that good. I don't, I don't know what I can post uh, that, that equals that. So um, I think that um, we have these online personas that are not necessarily accurate reflections of our real lives and that is creating um, uh, a false measurement um, for how we evaluate and look at ourselves. Um, we all have problems, we all have flaws, um, we all have struggles, and, um, and looking into a, a universe that doesn't look like that, it's not real. And, and I think that there's a lot of pressure that builds up because, because of this, this uh, false reflection of what, what humans are actually going through. Thank you for sharing all of that information. I almost wanted to belt out an amen because that, <laughs> that was really good stuff. Um, coming from a generation, as I shared, my father is a Baptist preacher, and I have this lap mat on that I was introduced to at an early age from my Pentecostal grandmother. Um, I come from a generation of pray it away. And so this is a question for all of the leaders on the panel. Do you all feel as though religious leaders are prepared for the tough mental health conversations? Again, going back, and thank you for being transparent and examining themselves, do you feel as though they're prepared? Did we just, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, as long as my imam's not in the audience, no. <laughs> No, he's actually pretty good, but um, so the pray it away, um, you know, I hadn't heard it said that way, but I can totally relate to that. In, in my community, I think for a long, long time, um, the idea, there's a certain idea that if you're feeling sad and if you're feeling depressed and people interchange the two as if though they're the same, then there's something defective about your spirituality, right? And, and then the natural reaction of a lot of religious folks is to, in a, comes from a good place, they're trying to help, but it's always, well, you should be reading more Quran and why don't you do this or that? And, and here's a, a ritual prayer that you can do over and over again and you should pay more attention during your ritual daily five prayers and you know there's a way you can fast which makes it better for you. And the intention is good, but it makes sometimes the person receiving that advice feel like, well, this is my fault, right? Like, it's because I'm not spiritually, you know, where I should be. I don't have that connection with God. And if I just tried harder, I could come snap out of it, right? And it, it doesn't really work that way. And, and many of this, the leaders, the religious leaders in our communities, in my community, um, it's, there's a spread, to be honest. There are folks who really understand what their expertise is and what their expertise is not, how to figure out when someone is in crisis or struggling, and how to say, well, let's deal with the spiritual dimension of this, but let me also refer you to someone else who has expertise in counseling or, if needed, you know, some other kind of um, special skill to help therapeutically. Um, but there are many folks who are still in that pray it away mode, and that just makes people feel horrible. Like they're already underwater, right? And no, and no one can understand where they're coming from. And then when you say, well, you know, dhikr, which is the Islamic version of prayer beads, right? Just the recitation of certain prayers over and over again, you should be doing more dhikr. That's gonna help you out. And then it just, adds guilt on top of this um, feeling of anxiety or uh, emotional distress. So what type of training would you recommend? So the training, there are training programs available um, for religious leaders um, that basically is like first aid 
for the religious leader. So first aid for the imam or first aid for the prayer leader or whoever he or she may be, just for lay leaders in some cases in which their organizations will come out, um, gather folks together and say, here's how you recognize, um, first of all, just get the basics, the vocabulary, right? What's the difference between um, you know, psychosis versus a mood disorder versus an anxiety, you know, uh, issues with anxiety versus depression. Um, how do you recognize when someone's in crisis? And once you can triage those things, well, when do you know you're, it's, you can help, but the way you're gonna help is by being a part of that person's life, but getting him or her to help. That's professional help. And, you know, for a person who's respected in the community, who people go to for all their problems, for advice, for as a spiritual leader, sometimes it's really difficult to acknowledge that, you know, there's something they're not good at, you know what I mean? And for them to get, hey, this is not what my expertise is. So there are programs that can be organized for religious, you know, and spiritual leaders, for faith leaders. Um, but there's also for them, they need support too. Because, you know, they're getting folks that are coming to them a lot, and it can take a toll on them, who do they go to? So sometimes it's, it's counseling, self-peer counseling that they can go to as well. Yeah. My response to the question uh, with several layers to it, one, it's uh, predominantly Christian, but clinical pastoral education is something that I believe strongly in. My wife Liz is a hospital chaplain and she's, uh, that, that's been her heritage as well. And so that's available to help integrate a classroom theology with practical ministry uh, dealing with people in clinical uh, settings. Uh, another layer to that in how do we prepare uh, leaders to deal with it, uh, I, I think we help leaders know that they're not lone rangers. And again, that gets back to what I was saying earlier that it is something in the community, and, and maybe the younger ministers, younger than I, are doing that better than my generation uh, uh, did do it. Um, and part of the training, I, I don't know how you would do this, except I would tell them, pray the Psalms. <laughs> Teach leaders, religious leaders, to, to pray the Psalms, because the Psalms are so embodied. Uh, it's got curses in there, it's got blessings, in there, it's got the body in there and, and, and the whole life of the community as well as the individual. And so rather than, than creating leaders that are uh, specialists, that we are general practitioners in being with the human being and one aspect that encompasses that is the spirituality of the human being. Um. There was once a little boy, we'll call him Johnny, and he came home really late. Uh, his parents were looking for him. Johnny, why, why are you home so late? And he said, well, I was with Susie, and Susie lost her doll. And they said, oh, did you, did you help her find her doll? And he said, no, I just helped her cry. Um, and, and I find that, you know, a place like a synagogue or a church or a mosque is considered by so many that, that safe place, that place where they feel at home, it's an extension of their home. And it may be the very first stop in getting help. And although um, I, I am not uh, a clinician of any, of any kind, I know that, that people come when their days are dark and when their spirits are dark. And sometimes the first thing that you can do, and, I, and I, I've said this before, and a good friend taught me this, is, you know, when, when someone is, is coming to you and, and it's pouring in their life, um, just sitting with them with an umbrella and sitting in the rain with them is the first step for them feeling not isolated. Um, uh, depression in particular can be so isolating. It's so hard to reach out beyond that bubble and to let someone else in. It's such a vulnerable, vulnerable place. 
And so I think that our, our institutions, if we, and, and the leaders of those institutions, you know, we may not have the answers and, and, and we can certainly be the ones who direct our people to, uh, to experts, as you say, specialists. Um, but, you know, to have a soft place to land, to be that place where someone can come and cry, to be that place where someone can say, I'm hurting, or I've got a real problem, and I'm afraid to tell anybody, and I know that I'll have uh, your confidence if I tell you. Um, I think being that first stop and letting people know that this is, in fact, a safe place where you can let your guard down. We're all made in God's image, um, beautiful and broken, and, um, and we have our cracks, and, uh, and, and it's okay to show them. I, I learned of a, a great um, teaching, a Japanese custom that has to do with, um, with broken pottery. And, you know, in America, we're such a consumer culture, and when something's broken or it's not new anymore, we throw it out. We get something new. And in Japan, the Japanese culture is when your pottery breaks, um, not only do you repair it, but you fill those cracks with gold. And the cracks become an emblem, a, a part of the identity of the piece. And so helping people understand that it's okay to have cracks, that bruised hearts are hearts that, are, that have been living and, and, and been knocked around in life, um, that those, those things are okay. Those things make you human. And, and, and our, pla our places of worship are here to celebrate humanity with all of its flaws. And I think if we can let people know that our doors are open to everyone, uh, not everyone who's perfect, uh, but everyone. Um, and that if we can't help mend the spirit of the person who comes in, that we will direct them uh, to the resources and to the, the experts who can help them medically and clinically, um, that that's really um, the best thing we can do. Uh, and and I, I always find personally that it's, that it's a privilege to be able to sit some, with someone when they're vulnerable and just listen to them. And, um, and sometimes that's half of, of the mountain that they're climbing is just to feel comfortable enough to talk to someone and let them listen. Thank you. Thank you. So for us, we expect people to come in at a point where they're breaking open. So that's kind of what we're looking for. I mean, I'm not looking for someone to come in in a state of psychosis, but we have this saying that if you have something more fun to do than come sit Zen meditation, you should go do that. <laughs> because we're, we're here to really work with the hard stuff. So... Um, and sitting long retreats, people really do deal with some hard stuff. It's you know normal on a long retreat for several people to break down crying, and we have times you know for people to go and talk to a teacher. And but on the other hand, we do have a, a, a network into within the teachers and priests of knowing when someone needs to go get professional help because we're not really we're not here to like for instance I'm bipolar too, uh, I would never expect to go in to a Zen priest and say, help me deal with my bipolar too. Uh, so that's, we're not there for that. So we, we do have to be really cognizant of when someone is showing some signs of needing clinical help. Um, so that's, it. that's what I have to say. Thank you all so much for sharing. Um, we may have time for one or two questions. Thank you all for being here and for sharing your experiences. So um, I had the sad experience of suffering um, someone in our community committing suicide and the same week, a family member. And so 
I called my rabbi and said, how does Judaism respond to this? And I was going, my family member was of a different faith. So I want to ask you, how does your faith address this condition that seems to be happening quite consistently in our community um, around uh, suicide? Well, from the Buddhist perspective, um, our life is not our own life, so it's not ours to take. So I would, I would say that if someone came and um, practiced with us, we would try to get them to understand that even though things seem hopeless and you don't have anything to offer, you certainly do. And um, yet people, we lose people. So that will happen too, I, unfortunately. Sure. Yeah, thank you, Deke. Um So s suicide um, in the American Muslim community, especially amongst the youth, is considered like an active crisis right now. In the um, Atlanta metro area in the last year, there have been at least half a dozen that I'm aware of. Um, and um, most of the families don't want to talk about it. Um, and there's some historical reasons for that um, and cultural reasons for that because of a lot of the stigma associated with suicide and the traditional understanding of the religion, you know, that's considered sinful. And so folks don't want to be talking about it. Now, I do see an evolution and a change going on right now. There's a change in the conversation where there's a lot more understanding and nuance and um, a reinterpretation of what was traditional teaching to say, wait a second, there's suicide and then there's a mental health issue. So no one, you know, which is an illness um, and we've got to have a conversation about what that means from a spiritual perspective just to lift that stigma but wait a second, forget about all that. Like, we can worry about uh, heaven and hell and your spirituality later. What about our kids who are struggling with this, and why didn't they come to someone in the community? How have we failed them? And so um, leaving theology aside, there's a recognition, I think, more than ever before that um, suicide prevention and su suicide interventions and, and knowing how to intervene when someone um, may be at risk for hurting themselves is something that our faith leaders need to learn about how to deal with. And not just faith leaders, lay leaders, and, and just community members in general. Um, and there's a lot of speculation about why this is happening now. I don't think it's unique to the Muslim community, um, but the Muslim community is just starting to talk about it whereas before it was never discussed. I'm, I'm sure the statistics may have been the same 20 years ago, it was just swept under the rug and now folks are willing to talk about it. So I think that's a good thing that we're talking about it and the attitudes from a theological, you have real well-respected imams who are saying, wait a second, it is overly simplistic representation of our faith tradition to say, this is a sinful thing. We are not going to talk about it, and um, we're going to sweep it under the rug. Let's have a nuanced discussion about the theology of it, but let's do that after we establish a first aid response system for those who are uh, you know, at risk for hurting themselves. Suicide is a very complex story that leads to it. Um, in my line of work, one of our employees uh, years ago uh, committed suicide, and uh, you, you deal with uh, the damage of the family and the extended family uh, about that. Uh, the theological piece often, as you were saying, people go to, and there are some strains of Christianity that say it's a sin and you go to hell. Uh, that's not what I say. Uh, and so, uh, to me, that uh, I want to push that off off the the board. Um, most of the time with suicide, realizing that it's a 
complex set of things that lead to that, that result. But then how do you deal with the, su the survivors and how to do deal with their shame and their guilt and all of the, uh, that's left behind? And so I would hope that in a Christian tradition that grace that we talk about, we may not do it so well, but I would hope that at, of all times uh, in our practice of faith, that grace and love and uh, forgiveness uh, would be the uh, standard operating procedure at those times. Um, the, I, I would add to that um, also that I don't think um, theologically we approach uh, suicide as uh, a sin. Um, when we when we pray for healing in Judaism, we pray for both the healing of the body and the healing of the spirit. And um, I had a close friend um, commit suicide uh, seven years ago. And I remember sitting uh, with his family and, and they were really all in shock. They didn't see it coming. They, they knew that he had, you know, he had a little, he had some struggles. He had, you know, he was sad every once in a while. Um, they didn't see this coming at all and they felt such guilt and, uh, and felt so responsible. And, um, you know, helping them realize that it's really hard to see inside someone. You know, we don't have uh, we don't have X-rays that can see someone's spirit, and um, and to try and lift the 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 burden and the guilt off of those who are the survivors are 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 certainly the very first mandate we have as as spiritual communities is to to hold those those survivors close to us and and shepherd them through their their pain. Um, and, uh, and, and I believe exactly, um, what you were saying, um, Nabil, about, about just being able to have the conversation and take the shame out of it. This happens, and it happens in our community. We're not immune, um, to suicide, uh, is, uh, it's hard to, to, to look at ourselves in the mirror and say, oh, uh, we we're not we're not immune from this. We're not perfect, and and it's our responsibility to um, to become the people who can see those first signs and 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 direct and direct people to the the crisis centers that can help them, and also to be the safety net um, for those who are unfortunate survivors of of such tragedy, and and make sure that they don't feel stigmatized and that they can you know, walk in a sanctuary full of people and not feel the burning eyes of everyone on them, but feel a loving embrace instead. And I think that's, I think that's, uh, that's a very hard thing. To, it's an easy thing to say and a hard thing to accomplish, but I think it's, a, it's an aspiration for sure that we can, uh, that we can look towards uh, to reaching. Is there anyone else in the audience? Any questions? Um, I'm a clinician, and I wanted to say first, thank you for s directing faith leaders to send people toward the clinical world. I appreciate that so much. And my question was, how can we on the clinical side do better when it comes to faith. So maybe my um, statement to the clinical side would be, please tell people about the teachings of the Buddha. Uh, we do much more than just meditate. Uh, we believe that the, <laughs> the community is very important, the teachings of the Buddha are very important, the teachings of the ancestors are very important, um, devoting your life to a spiritual practice is very important, it doesn't have to be Buddhism. Um, so the, this sense of community, I'm not sure you could get the same sense of community in a clinical setting, um, practicing meditation in a clinical setting, or just even practicing med uh, meditation in a public library with a community group. And uh, so there's still this kind of sense of, I want to meditate, but I don't want to be involved in this other religious stuff. 
Um, but I think the religious stuff is good. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's my answer. <laughs> a lot of folks in the clinical world are not comfortable with this world. They don't really get it or understand it. And so folks who are comfortable with a place of worship that are from the clinical world, it's really important that you help um, your colleagues understand the really um, important um, underlying frameworks and paradigms that folks that are faith-based in their, in their mindset, how important a religion or a, a, a faith or a, a spiritual practice can be, it can color everything about your beliefs and your practices. And then that's a general statement about um, the importance of faith and being comfortable with people who have a faith tradition in general and how it can motivate so much of their, their thinking. Nabil, um, could you explain to us or give us just a couple of ideas um, from a clinical perspective as well as spiritual what we can do for self-care. Wow, if I knew the answer, I don't know, but I'll try my best. Um, so for, for self-care, um, you know, I, I do agree with what was said earlier. First of all, it takes a little bit of deliberation for each one of us to take a pause and figure out what can I change about my, um, by, by my rushed, anxious lifestyle? To take a step every day, whether that is a practice um, that's a spiritual or faith-based or religious practice, or it's something altogether different. Um, wellness, the concept of wellness, the concept of resilience, the, the concepts of taking some time to make sure you're okay, um, it is so critical now um, for each and every single one of us. Um, if we are not actively making time to take care of ourselves, it will catch up to us. And it will usually be at that point, a point where you're just broken. And it takes active effort, active habits, um, in my opinion, to prevent that from happening from all of us. And from a clinical perspective, um, I would say there's really no difference between the two. I mean, um, making sure that, that we um, incorporate practices, whether they're spiritual or physical exercise um, or community and family-based, um, and to make sure that we're together with others and routines really help with that. So. Um, in my opinion, establishing habits that get you centered, um, reconnected um, with either others or uh, God or um, a, a peaceful place um, need to be practiced and, and, and time needs to be made for those. You know, it's like, it's like healthcare um, costs. You know, folks can either um, spend time on taking care of their bodies, and that takes time and effort and money. Or when they're ill, they'll spend time with the medication and the treatment. And we, that's intuitive to a lot of us when it comes to our physical well-being, but it's exactly the same for our emotional and mental well-being. If, it's not, if you're not putting in time and effort and establishing routines, it will we will have to put in time and effort later on when we're dealing with an issue. Thank you for those remarks. Healing is personal in, in every way, right? Um, some people need support in healing. Some people are able to push forward 
um, and maybe they're looking internally for, for that support. And so I think it's important to, for anybody to know that you're not alone in whatever you're going through or however you need to move forward, that there's always a group of people that are willing to support you, you know, both from a clinical perspective and a side of doing that, uh, but also in a faith perspective. And so if you are engaged in a faith community, there's a way to, to become involved there. Thanks for watching. Go to aibtv.com forward slash donate to support programming like this. Your contributions may be tax deductible.